For the top 10 for 11th of August, 91, I'm a non-conformist. But you may higher rate it, indeed appreciate it, and mark my words as mere hollow bombast. So at number 10 we have Ring 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 by De La Soul, which is typically early 90s hustle and bustle. There's nothing about it which isn't utterly disposable and it's a shame because the first two De La Soul albums were fresh and forward pointing. But on their third, from which this is taken, the appropriately named De La Soul is dead, they just sounded generic and faded into irrelevance shortly thereafter. Number nine is Last Train to Trans Central by the KLF, which is another load of thumpy doof-doof. The fashion of the time seems to be as crammed as much as you can into an arrangement, and this number certainly lives up to that. The next entry seems fitting, because as I write this, the sad news of Olivia Newton-John's death is still heavy in the air. She's in the top 10 this week, at eight, with the Grease Megamix, Livy had 33 chart entries, 15 of which made the top 10 and 6 made number 1 if you count her duets with John Travolta. She never had a hit that stopped at number 5. The Megamix quit the number 1 spot on July 7, but as well as being a mega hit, it boosted the soundtrack album back up to number 1 as well. Number seven is the almost embarrassingly bad I want to sex you up by the appropriately named Colour Me Bad. Embarrassing because a bad, or in this case a blandly generic New Jack swing record is one thing, but to do so with such a blatant and unsubtle impression of Prince is just belittling to the record. Prince ruled the world in 1991. Diamonds and Pearls came out at the start of October. A very fine album indeed was out in November. Diamonds and Pearls bested its song for song in every way. Although it must be said that Dangerous did outsell Diamonds and Pearls considerably. So in what was the golden era for the musical form, Colour Me Bad just sounds like an overproduced machine less than the sum of its parts that insults its influences. Number six, speaking of which, more uselessness, with Things That Make You Go Mmm, a song with lyrics that's so inane that even a person who doesn't pay attention to the lyrics, like me, tends to think they suck. Really, I could do this top ten in four minutes flat if I left all these insults out. Time for our latest segment, Hello and Goodbye where we say hello to the new entrants to the top 10 and goodbye to the fading ones. And like the rest of this week's charts, it's completely useless because the top 10 is unchanged from last week. I swear to God, this is the worst instalment I've ever done. Let's keep going and see if it gets any better. At five, it's popular wedding song and not exactly power ballad, the moderately pleasant more than words by Extreme. Five weeks in and finding it tough going to climb to the upper reaches, it took another month to reach number two where it spent two weeks. But there was no getting past the invincible number one and it shot its bolt, falling down the charts. But it is the best thing we've heard so far this week. At number four is a treat for lovers of all things Les Pauline, vocally screechy and thunderously drumtastic. Guns and Roses with You Could Be Mine. What I like to call a shopping mall band, as in the song the local hood rats would listen to on cheap boom boxes outside the Ipswich Library or in the appropriately named Bottle Alley. Reference there is probably something only my daughter would get. It's no great shakes as a song, it's lively and certainly would rattle those Kmart boom boxes, but it just seems to be a bit of a mishmash of hard rock, what have you. In at number three is Read My Lips by Melissa, a soap opera star who was trying to reach to be the next Kylie Minogue. She didn't really come close and she never reached such giddy heights despite her mononymous title, she was no Prince or Madonna. She did manage four top 40 hits though and Read My Lips was a two week number one disposed of by the current incumbent. She acted in a few more soaps, did some modelling, a profession for which she was more than amply qualified, and lives today in Sydney. All this happy, successful career doesn't make this a great record. It was written and produced by hirelings of the TV show Melissa was starring on at the time. 
chosen out of the group to audition to become pop stars. Melissa won. I don't know if it was by dint of talent or by dint of her being the best looking of the ones they chose. It doesn't really matter in this case. The record is no great shakes, her performance is spunky but not spectacular, and had she not gone on to such success in further TV ventures, she'd probably be appearing in Breakfast TV Where Are They Now segments. Anyone familiar with this series and The Righteous Bo Jambo will know I'm a great admirer of Nat King Cole's contribution to the history of R&B. Cole died in 1965, but thanks to the miracle of modern technology, he's back. At number two this week, it's his mawkish, exploitative and pointless duet with his somewhat less talented daughter Natalie on one of Zombie Nat's greatest hits, Unforgettable. Two was as high as it got, but it did spend three weeks there and was the 12th biggest hit of the year. You'd think there'd be plenty of trivia around such a trivial week, but, well, no. Biggest riser on the charts this week was Pump It Hard, Nice and Hard by Icy Blue, which is exactly as dreadful as it sounds. Biggest faller this week was actually one of the better songs on the chart, Rhythm of My Heart by Rod Stewart. It peaked at number two, thwarted by the Grease Megamix from becoming his fourth number one hit. Top debutante is Jo Beth Taylor's 99 Reasons, which has 99 problems. Unbelievably, this lasted nine weeks on the charts, maxing out at 31. Also, unbelievably, the same record was number one when it debuted as it was when it dropped out. And the longest running chart hit was a song called 3AM Eternal by the KLF. Your guess is as good as mine. Top of the Pops from the coast of California to the shores of the Delaware Bay was Brian Adams' Everything I Do, I Do It For You, which spent seven weeks at number one. The hitch is Billboard calculated their charts on sales play and airplay. Had they calculated sales only, it would have been number one for 17 weeks, which would have made it the longest running number one of the physical era. If you think they were cuckoo for the Canadian wonder kid, the UK was positively nuts about him. The record spent 16 weeks at number one. The only song to run longer at number one was I Believe by Frankie Lane, and that took three spells at the top to do it, one of 13 weeks, one of two weeks, and one of three weeks, back in 1953. Looking at a bit of chart history, the number one record a year before was the untouchable MC Hammer with You Can't Touch This, a definite improvement over this week's assortment. And in 1992, it was Amigos Para Sempre from Jose Carreras and the singing chipmunk Sarah Brightman. And Melissa was unaccountably still having hits. Number one album in the city that's always had ideas above its station was Unforgettable With Love by Natalie Cole. It was finally toppled a couple of weeks later by Metallica's eponymous album, and people have been complaining ever since. Now all that remains to cap this miserable week is to unveil the number one hit. It's a pity that we have to waste such a jolly, cheery monkey to drum in what's been a thoroughly depressing week. Monty, beat it. The number one record this week was invariably Brian Adams with Everything I Do, I Do It For You, which was the theme song to a movie featuring Kevin Costner and having the scenery thoroughly chewed by Alan Rickman. The record was number one here for nine weeks. Um, the story goes that it could have gone on a lot longer at number one because it disappeared from the charts within two weeks of falling from number one but the record company stopped pressing it. They, uh, they withdrew the single so they could issue his next one, which doesn't make sense to me, but that's the, the story that you hear. I'm sure Adams didn't care either way. He was a factory for fake faux rock and roll and mawkish power balance the time. So that's how the cow ate the cabbage this week. I think it goes to illustrate the reason that 1991 is the end of the line for the series. Pop as we knew it had changed beyond recognition. It had become a cross-marketing opportunity for other products like 
soap operas, soft drinks and whatnot. Nowadays it's endemic, only the focus now reaches to classic rock sounds. Bob Dylan was once the voice of a generation, now he's the voice of Airbnb. So if the good Lord's willing and the creeks don't rise, I'll see you again in our next exotic stop in that most foreign of countries, the past. <laughs>